All right, so most of the time in studio-based production as well as field production, when we are worrying about audio, we spend an enormous amount of time worrying about acquisition, okay? Uh, and so what that means is uh, essentially we spend a, an awful lot of time uh, concerning ourselves with microphones uh, and the properties of microphones. Uh, and, and so uh, to begin today, I, I want to talk about what a microphone does, okay, uh, before we get into the nitty gritty about it. Uh, essentially, a microphone is a transducer, okay, and what that means is that it changes one thing into another thing, okay. Uh, essentially, uh, for audio, what's going on when you make a sound, when you make a sound, whether you're stomping your foot or you're using your voice, uh, when you make a sound, you are compressing and expanding air molecules. Compressing and expanding air molecules. And that compression and expansion creates a wave a wave, uh, and if you could look at it, if you could look at it, it would sort of look like what you see when you throw a rock into a pond, okay? So from the source of the audio, the waves expand outwards 360 degrees from the source. Uh, but it looks something like this. It's an air pulse. It's a pulse. Uh, and over time, it goes away, okay, so it will eventually dissipate. It will eventually dissipate as it expands. When you put a microphone in front of it, when you put a microphone in front of it, like so, the microphone receives or responds to that airwave, all right? And inside of a microphone, what you have typically is some type of an air bladder, some type of an air bladder with a magnet on it, and then another magnet, okay? And as the air wave hits that little disc, that disc is going to vibrate, okay? It's going to vibrate. And those magnets are going to get closer together and further apart, responding in a fashion kind of like this. Does that make sense? And that is what creates the electrical wave, all right? That's what creates the electrical wave, is these magnets just moving apart and coming together, responding. So the result here, the result, what comes out of the microphone, is an electromagnetic wave, which also is a wave. Okay, but it's an electromagnetic wave, and an electromagnetic wave, uh, in a very simple way, is the compression and expansion of electrons, or the charge and discharge. Um, but you can think of it as compression and expansion of electrons. All right, so, just so that we're all on the same page, this air wave is moving at the speed of sound, which is generally actually pretty slow, all right? This is moving at the speed of light. It's moving at the speed of light. Which one's faster? <laughs> yes, light, good. You might want to look up the speed of light, okay? So this is moving at the speed of sound. This is moving at the speed of light, all right? Now, once you have converted your signal into an electromagnetic signal, you can do a lot of fun things with it, <laughs> all right? It will flow on a wire. It'll flow on a wire. Uh, you can encode it and shoot it using RF through microwaves, all right? Uh, and that's exactly what we use for satellite transmission and things like that, all right? So once it's in its electrical form, you're in good shape. Now, the other side of the equation is a speaker, a speaker or a monitor. And I don't know how many of you have ever taken the time to take one of those things apart 
uh, or have ever seen one laying in pieces. Uh, but a speaker is simply a fairly large membrane with a giant magnet on the back, <laughs> all right? And so when that electromagnetic signal hits that magnet, what do you think is going to happen? That thing's going to do what? Yeah, it goes back and forth like this. You ever see that? You ever look at a speaker without a cover on it? Yeah, it's doing this. All right, sometimes you can actually see it, especially with bass. You can really see it move on bass, but if the high frequencies are very difficult to see, but it's moving. All right, and so what's it doing? It's recreating what? It's recreating this. Does that make sense? So a speaker is a transducer as well. All right, so the microphone converts the airwave sound. It converts the airwave to the electromagnetic wave. The speaker reverses the situation. Make sense? Very basic physics. All right, so, but what, like I said right at the beginning, we spend most of our time worrying about acquisition. We need to get nice, clean acquisition. We already talked about signal strength, right? Remember that? Minus 20 dB average for digital. So one of the things we want to make sure of when we are using microphones is that we are acquiring our audio not too strong, not too weak, not over-modulated, not under-modulated, but right on the money, right around minus 20 dB. So that's what we spend an awful lot of time worrying about, all right, is microphones, microphones and microphones. So let's talk about microphones. The first way that we deal with these things is we talk about microphone types, microphone types. Microphone types, whoops, microphone types, and the type of microphone quite literally is referring to what it looks like. It is the body style, the body style, what it looks like. It's the body style. It's like the difference between a sedan a pickup truck and a minivan. It's literally the body style. It's what this thing looks like. Does that make sense? Now, the uh, most common studio microphone, the most common studio microphone, is a microphone that's fairly small uh, and it's called a lavalier. 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 All right, and the lavalier looks like this. A lot of different companies make them, okay? This one happens to be an Audio-Technica, but Sony makes them. There's other folks that make them. Uh, but this is what a lavalier microphone looks like. First off, you have, if I can get this all untangled, Uh, somebody taped it on there. Of course, the one I pick is mangled. There we go. So what you have here is the microphone head. That's the microphone head on a lavalier. Okay. Now, they do get a little bit bigger than that, but they do get a lot smaller than that. It just depends on which manufacturer you went with, okay? But that's the head of a lavalier. Then your lavalier will have a power pack. It'll have a power pack, and I'll just go ahead and hook this together. There we go. It'll have a power pack of some type. This one, uh, the Audio-Technica happens to be a square, but don't be surprised. The Sony ones are like a cylinder, all right? Uh, if it's got an on-off switch, if it's got an on-off switch, and this one does, if it has an on-off switch, good rule of thumb, it has a battery, all right? If it has an on-off switch, it has a battery. And so, 
if you take a look at the top of this thing, the top comes off and in fact there's a spot for a little AA battery. Uh, these microphones don't use up a whole lot of juice, so a battery will last something like 900 hours, all right? But you have to remember to actually turn off the power pack. Otherwise, when it's sitting in the cabinet, it's doing what? Using up juice, all right? So this is a lavalier. Uh, and so I'll just go ahead and pass this around, starting back here. You can take a look at it. But it's the most common studio mic is the lavalier. It's the one you're going to run into the most. Uh, sometimes people call it a tie clip mic. Sometimes people call it a tie clip mic uh, because oftentimes when you look at a male anchor, it's attached to the what? The, the tie. All right. But again, uh, you know, with slight differences, with slight differences, you'll be able to identify a lavalier pretty well. They all essentially look the same. All right, the second uh, microphone type that I want to talk about today is the most common field microphone. It's the most common field microphone used in EFP, ENG, and lots of other things. Uh, and occasionally we do use this type of microphone in a studio. It's probably the one microphone that you are the most familiar with, uh, quite simply because they are so common. Uh, it's called a handheld. It's called a handheld. Handheld. You hold it in your, duh, in your hand. And so this one is an Electra voice. It's an RE50. Uh, it's a great, really rugged, solid microphone. Uh, it's essentially a, uh, a 635 in a bigger case. But anyhow, that is a handheld. That's a handheld. How many of you have seen this type of mic? Yeah, sure. Now this mic here does not have an on-off switch. What would you think? Does it have a battery or not? Yeah, no on off switch, no battery. All right, so just something to look for. All right, so this is a handheld. You can pass that around and take a look at it. It's the most common field microphone. We do use them in studios. We do. We do use them in studios. It just happens to be the most common field mic. Okay, question? Uh, no, that one's not wireless. The one I'm wearing right now, can you see it? This one's wireless. This one's a wireless lavalier. That one is designed to be wired. So if you look at the bottom of the power pack, you'll see those three pins. That's where the audio cable hooks up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. When you get the uh, RE50, Take a look at the very bottom of it, and you'll see the same three pins. Uh, and again, that's where your audio cable hooks up. Uh, the next mic I want to talk about is a long cylinder. Looks like a long tube. I have two different versions of this one to show you. Does anybody know the name of that mic? I heard it. Yeah, that's a shotgun. That's a shotgun. That's a shotgun mic. So number three here is a shotgun. A shotgun. And uh, shotguns are used in the field. Uh, sometimes they're used uh, also in the studio uh, quite often. A shotgun is used uh, for a very specific purpose that we'll get to in a minute, all right? Uh, but a lot of times you'll see these things mounted on a pole, all right? You'll see them mounted on a pole, and it's quite simply a, uh, a member of the production team will hold that pole up uh, with the mic up above the talent out of the shot, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's just, that is a shotgun, so let me pass this around. This one also does not have an on-off switch. 
Uh, I collect old microphones just for something to do. So what do you think this one is? Let's take a look at this. What's it look like so far? Does it look like a lavalier, a handheld, or a shotgun? A ray gun. <laughs> Looks like a ray gun from like 1950s. Stop the Martians. Pew, pew. What's it look like the most? One, two, or three? Three. Three, yeah. This is a this is a old antique shotgun made by Electro Voice. Has a different type of base, a mounting uh, system. Uh, but this is a classic from the 60s. But again, it's another shotgun. Uh, the fourth type of microphone that I want to talk about, I only have one of the antiques <laughs> to show you, and it looks like this. You ever see a mic like that? Okay, what do you think that, and, and again, these can be mounted in different ways, and we'll talk about mounts and accessories and all that malarkey later, but this is very, this is a specific type of mic. Can anybody tell me what that's for? What that is? Designed to sit on a what? On a desk, therefore it's a desktop, a desktop. That's a type of mic. A desktop. A desktop. All right, a desktop. Sometimes a tabletop, whatever. All right. Uh, this one, believe it or not, this style of microphone is still very, very popular. People like the old look. People like the old look, and they'll spend real money to get these <laughs> uh, old ones rebuilt. But this company actually still makes this mic uh, because a lot of people still want them so they they still build these types of microphones I have two or three of these in my office so anybody that wants to come see some old microphones if you're completely bored one day you can come see Utterback's microphone collection um, that one's an a static that one's an a static just another mic company here and I'll gather these up so that you can Take notes. Uh, and then the last type of microphone, the last type that I want to talk about, I actually don't have an example to show you. Uh, so I'll give you the name and then I'll describe it for you. It's called a PZM. PZM stands for Pressure Zone Microphone. Pressure Zone, Pressure Zone Mic. Pressure zone mic, pressure zone microphone, and what it looks like. What it looks like is a plate. Looks like a plate, about six inches square. Looks like a plate. All right, and on the plate, it's a very flat plate. And then what you would have is a very small pickup. You'd see a little bump on it which is essentially the pickup, although sometimes it's a circular pad kind of a thing. And then you would see the wire coming off of it, okay? But it's a PZM. PZMs have a very specific use. Uh, PZMs are used uh, most often for miking stages, for miking stages. So let's say you had uh, a, uh, a company coming in to do a performance uh, in a theater and there you are, tap dancing, or uh, the most famous one, what was it, Lord of the Dance, or whatever, those Irish stomp dancers, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, also, you know, so what they can do with that, with these PZMs, is they mount them up underneath the stage, all right? And so when a dancer, when a dancer goes like this, instead of sounding like that, it sounds like what? Boom! Does that make sense? Also, a lot of times, how many of you have ever been to a rock and roll concert with a drum kit? And you'll see PZMs mounted inside the bass drum. Okay, but that's essentially what it is. I don't think it's really worth me passing this around. It's just a piece of metal, okay? But that's what a PZM looks like. 
Have, have many of you, any of you uh, gone to see a percussion show? They're st more and more popular. Uh, anybody, percussion shows? Uh, yeah, where the guys are banging on all kinds of different things to make different rhythms and whatnot. Yeah, well, PZMs would be rather popular for those types of uh, productions. All right, so those are the five basic types. The five basic types. Almost everything else that you run into is going to be a, a slight modification of one of those five basic types. All right. Sometimes you'll run into a lavalier that is super duper itty bitty. I mean, almost like the size of a human hair. Super itty bitty. They can in fact be glued onto the face of the talent. All right. And you can't see them. They're that small. All right. Sometimes you'll have uh, one of these handheld or uh, desktops. Have you ever seen one of these mounted upside down like that? Like in a boxing ring? The guy brings it down. On in this corner, we've got the Challenger from Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, it's just one of these mounted upside down, duh. All right. So the next one, the final one I want to show you though is kind of a modification of this. And it's also sort of a modification of a handheld. This is a, a microphone that's used for very high end, very high quality recording. And it's a modification of a desktop, but it's got some same elements. Please, class, do not drop this, okay? This is a ribbon mic. This is a ribbon mic. And it's designed to be mounted in two ways, either like that or like this. Uh, but it's designed for very high sensitivity, high sensitivity, and almost perfect acquisition, if you really want to think about it that way. Uh, this is what you would use when you're making a sound recording. Uh, for, let's say, I don't know, Taylor Swift's going to come in and sing or something. This is the type of mic you would use for that, but very careful with that one. Very careful, please. Um, and so it's a very sensitive type of mic. Uh, again, you would use that only in a specifics, uh, like a, a recording studio type of a situation. That's not the type of microphone that you would take with you in the field. Okie dokie. Questions about the five basic types? Questions about the five basic types? Eh? Yeah? How much, cost? How much do microphones cost? Well, <laughs> uh, you know, you can get a very good quality handheld microphone for probably about 200, 250 bucks. Um, but I have seen, uh, oh, and that's pretty much the same for a fairly good lavalier. It's probably about 200, 250 bucks. Uh, but once you start getting into some of these different types, your prices are going to go way, way up. Uh, you know, a high quality, professional quality uh, shotgun could easily cruise past 500, easily. Uh, and most certainly ribbon mics that are high sensitivity could easily get close to 1,000. Uh, it just really depends on what you're going for. You know, there are inexpensive mics that are cheap, uh, and they're cheaply made. Uh, and, and one of the things that really you have to think about is what is the acquisition characteristics of the mic? You know, the range of human hearing is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, right? So a perfect microphone can acquire 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. But that's asking an awful lot of a machine if you think about it. So if you have a microphone that can acquire that entire range, the price is going to go up. And as we'll learn with shotguns, shotguns are directional microphones with uh, distance characteristics. The longer it 
acquires, or the further out that it can reach, the more it's going to cost. Is that about a hundred and fifty dollar one for like an arm trimmer? Uh huh. There's like a slight noise in the background, like a the wind. What does that mean? I have no idea. Unless I had the unit in front of me, I wouldn't be able to postulate. But you know, mics, inexpensive mics are going to be noisier. They will be noisier, but questioning where is that noise coming from, right? Is it something in the mic? Is it something in the cable? Is it something in your recording device? You know, it's, it's kind of difficult to troubleshoot a mic unless you're actually looking at the problem, okay? Unless you're actually looking at the problem. So five basic types. Now, the next way that we talk about them is how they actually acquire sound in terms of their polar pattern or pickup pattern, all right? And there's five pickup patterns that you have to know. There's five pickup patterns. And these are also called polar patterns. I call them pickup patterns because that's really what it's all about, pickup patterns. And this is where we start to get into a bit of confusion, uh, but I think you'll understand once we lay it out. All right, so a pickup pattern is talking about how the microphone acquires sound. It's its directional characteristic. Directional characteristic. Directional characteristic. So if this microphone picked up sound from all directions, so from this direction, from that direction, from that direction, no matter where I point it, if it picked up sound from all directions, the pickup pattern would be called omnidirectional. 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 Picks up sound from all directions, okay? So if this thing was an omni, if this was an omni and I was doing an interview with someone, I could quite simply just hold the mic in between us like this and I could just ask questions and he could answer me. So where are you going for spring break next spring, huh? Jamaica. Jamaica, all right, sweet. But I wouldn't have to move the mic. Does that make sense? I could also kind of hold it like that and it would still pick me up. I could talk like this. I could rap like that. What is that? I still haven't figured out why, the ra why some rappers do, why? Because it's what? Cool. Oh, that's cool? Ouch. Cool. It is. All right, so the next time I have to give a public speech, I'm going to grab one of these things and go, Welcome to the Department of Communication. Hi, I'm Dr. Adam Rack. All right, so uh, omnidirectional. Now, the next pickup pattern is a directional pickup pattern, and it's called uni directional, unidirectional, and that means that the microphone picks up sound in any one, one direction, one direction. And so what's happening here is you're starting to cut off the sensitivity off the back side of this thing and you're starting to focus it out like this. So really take a good look at my hands. Stop what you're doing and take a look at my hands. That's what's starting to happen. Do you follow me on that? That's really what a uni pattern, polar pattern starts to look like, is kind of like that. So if I go back over here, all right, and I'm going to do my interview, what I'd have to do is something more like this. So uh, what's your favorite automobile manufacturer? Volkswagen. Volkswagen, are you aware that they cheated on their diesel engines? 
That's why I love them. Cheaters. <laughs> Gotta love cheaters. Okay. But you'd have to do this back and forth business. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the audio. Does that make sense? You wouldn't acquire it. So, is it important then to know what kind of mic you have in your hand? Yeah, because if you're a reporter or if you're a host or hostess, you need to know whether or not you can just do this or whether you need to start doing this business, right? Or if you're giving a public speech and you're standing at a podium, you need to know whether you need to kind of stay on the mic, right? If it's an omnidirectional mic, can you sort of move away from it a little bit? And it would still probably pick you up if it was an omni, but if it's a uni, you need to kind of stay on it, right? How many of you have been to an assembly where somebody's giving a speech or they're giving remarks and they don't know what kind of mic they have and they keep going across the microphone? And so sometimes you can hear them, but most of the time you can't. Have you had that experience and you're sort of sitting there in the audience and you immediately pull out your cell phone and start texting, <laughs> right? Because you can't deal, well, you can't hear what they're saying, so I may as well do something else, right? Yeah, it does happen all the time. All right, so how do I know, guys, quick question, how do I know what pickup pattern this mic is? How do I know? A picture? Uh, this one doesn't have a picture, but it has a label. This particular handheld is omnidirectional. Omnidirectional. Now, here's what you need to know. The microphone manufacturers make this exact mic, looks just like this, but it's a what? A uni. So you better read them. You better read them, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's actually on a sticker, all right? It's on a sticker. And if it's not on the microphone itself, go find the user manual, <laughs> all right? Look it up. Look it up and go, okay, what, what, what is this mic? Is it an Omni? Is it a Uni? Or three more, three more. The next pickup pattern is uh, also a directional pattern. It's a bit tighter. It starts to extend the sensitivity. It's called cardioid. Heart-shaped. Cardioid. C-A-R-D-I-O-I. C-A-R-D-I-O-I-D. Cardioid. Heart-shaped. Heart-shaped. But cardioid is a unidirectional pattern that starts to, what it starts to do is kind of interesting. It starts to, and I guess the best way to do this, picture a Valentine's Day heart sort of perched on top of this thing, all right, a Valentine's Day heart. But what it does is it narrows the sensitivity and extends that sensitivity. Do you follow that? So if I was conducting my interview with this guy, but he looks a little sketchy, right? And I don't want to get too close to him. You know, what I could do with a cardioid handheld is ask him a question like this and then get the answer from him. So why did you kill your dog? You didn't kill your dog? You sure look like a dog killer, dog killer. I kill cats. You kill cats. Cat killer. Admitted cat killer. All right. But anyway, listen, if it's cardioid pattern, now you really have to start to eat the microphone. Does that make sense? So if I'm using a cardioid mic, I need to keep that thing right in front of my mouth. Do you follow me on this? Otherwise, if I turn it just that far, the drop-off is going to be dramatic, all right? So I need to keep this mic in my face. So listen, cardioid patterns are really good, especially if you're in a noisy environment. If you're in a noisy environment, you can use something like a cardioid mic 
or even a uni for that matter, but you know, as long as you're eating the microphone as it were, guess what? You're not going to pick up all the noise around you. So let's say that you have a reporter who's live on the scene, all right? Uh, and maybe they're doing something fun. Maybe it's a feature story about the 4th of July or something like that, right? And so they're going to report live from the 4th of July fireworks. And there's 100 billion people behind them, right, that have been drinking all day. And the reporter's trying to do, you know, some kind of a... Here I am live in East Hartford at the 4th of July fireworks. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of people behind me. They've been drinking all day. Maybe not drinking all day, but you know what happens when you turn on a TV camera? What, what do all the people in the background do? They all start going, Woo! I'm on camera! Look at me! All dang! Check it out! Right? How many of you have done that yourselves? Hey, I'm on camera. <laughs> and then you see the guy that like backs up, right? And you're like, Okay, you know, listen, give your reporter the appropriate tool and you don't have to worry about a bunch of fraternity boys in the background going, Woo, you come. Make sense? All right. Now, once an audio engineer figures out how to do something, they typically keep going with it. All right, so the next two patterns are based off cardioid. It's simply an amplification of or modification of the cardioid pattern. So supercardioid and hypercardioid. Supercardioid, hypercardioid. Super, duper, cardioid, oops. Supercardioid, and the final pattern, hypercardioid. All right. And so, what do you think is going on with those? What do you think is going on with those? Yeah, exactly. Just push it together. And you're getting narrower, you're getting narrower. And you're doing what? Extending that sensitivity. So you're getting narrower and you are extending the sensitivity of the microphone. Yeah. Okay, so as you go from hyper to super, or from cardioid to super to hyper, what's essentially happening is you're doing this. If you look at my hands, you're doing this. You're starting to narrow the band and extend the band. All right. So uh, I don't know how many of you have ever watched sports. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have at least watched a football game once in your life. You ever see the audio guy running up and down the sideline? Okay. Are there audio guys actually running around on the field? No, they'd get crushed, right? So they're running up and down the sideline and they're using typically a shotgun and the shotgun is more than likely going to be super or hypercardioid. And what they're doing is they're acquiring audio from the field. You ever wonder why you can hear the football players so well? It's not like they're running around with wireless microphones on, okay, so that we can hear them tackle each other. Uh, well, the quarterbacks are using mics for different reasons. But you ever see the audio guys doing this? Right? And you can actually hear, you can actually hear the crunch when those guys slam together. Well, no, not really. Okay. Oh, well, you can sit in the audio booth and run the board. There you go. You're in the air conditioning. And then you get the intern to run up and down the sideline. Okay. Will it pick up wind? Yeah, it will. And that's one of those most awful things that's constantly bugging audio people is what? Wind noise. Wind noise. So one of the things we're going to have to learn about is how we deal with wind noise. How do we get rid of wind noise? 
Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. We'll get into, the, into that in a second. But listen to me. You don't know, just by looking at a mic, what pickup pattern it is, all right? Because there are lavaliers that are omnidirectional and unidirectional, and there are even cardioid lavaliers. There are uh, handhelds, most definitely manufactured in different patterns. Uh, same thing goes with shotguns, definitely same thing goes with uh, your desktops. PZMs are typically omnis, but let me try to give you the your best guess, all right? I'm going to give you your best guess. If you've got a lavalier, it's going to be a one or a two. If I was betting real money and you had a lavalier in your hand, I'd say it's either a one or a two. It's either a one or a two. If I was going to bet, it's either going to be Omni or Uni, all right? A handheld, a handheld, it's either going to be, I'm going to bet, eh, I'll put real money on one and two and maybe a little less, but it's not uncommon to find a three. So one, two, three. Shotguns, shotguns. If I'm betting on a shotgun, just looking at a, at a shotgun and without reading it, what do you think I'm going to bet? Three, four, five. Three, four, five. Desktop. What would you guess? Real money. What would you guess? It's what? I would guess cardioid. Cardioid? You need? I'm going to bet one, two, three. On a desktop, I'm going to bet one, two, three, probably even money. Uh, and then on a PZM, on a PZM, I'm going to definitely bet number one. But these are bets. These are not laws. <laughs> All right, these are not laws. These are just good bets. So you may say to yourself, "Well, Dr. Oderbach, you know, if you're doing audio." If you're doing audio, how do you choose? How do you choose? If you have all these different mics and all these different pickup patterns, how do you choose? So answer me, smart people. It depends on what you're doing. It depends on the context. It depends on all kinds of things, doesn't it? So a well-prepared audio person is going to have what? Options. You're going to have options. You're going to have a few uh, production bags with a couple of different kinds of mics in there, right? So that you can handle whatever situation you find yourself in. Does that make sense? Oh, by the way, let me give you a really unique use for a PZM. Let's say you're having a, uh, uh, a you're, you're shooting video of a conference room and you've got let's say 12 people sitting around a big table and they're all arguing about something instead of having 12 separate microphones on each person could you just throw a PZM in the middle of the table yeah you could you could throw a PZM right in the middle of the table and all 12 people would be talking right and they could be talking about whatever it is you know taxes or toll booths or whatever, doesn't matter. It would pick that up. Does that make sense? So PZMs are also uh, really useful for picking up sound on really hard, flat surfaces. All right. All right, questions on the pickup patterns? Clear as mud? All right. How much would you bet that these five and those five are going to be on the midterm? Huh. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is what you had referred to, wind noise. All right, let's talk about windscreens. Let's talk about windscreens. Let's talk about mounts, accessories, mounts, accessories, 
windscreens. All right, pretty much every single microphone that you run into, pretty much every single microphone you run into uh, will have a windscreen available. It'll have a windscreen available. And nine times out of 10, these things are just foam covers. They're just foam covers for the particular mic that you're dealing with. So let me grab one for a lavalier. This is just a foam windscreen for a lavalier. Now you may say, well, Dr. Oderberg, I don't get it. There's not a whole lot of wind inside of a studio. Why would you use a windscreen in a studio? Yeah. People breathe, right? It will also cut down on plosive sounds, all right? And it, it'll also cut down on S's. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you can go ahead and use one of those things. And by the way, it's also going to protect the microphone in case you have a spitter. Ew! Really? Yucko! Yeah. Uh, it will protect the microphone from spitters. Uh, but that's just a basic windscreen. Uh, another type of windscreen, which is really cool, this one's for the... Uh, this one's for the shotgun, because I don't think, yeah, the handheld didn't have one. This is a mount and a windscreen. This is a mount and a windscreen. It's called a blimp. It's called a blimp, and it's designed for a shotgun. It's designed for a shotgun, although there are foam covers for shotguns that look very similar to that uh, foam cover that I passed around for the lavalier. But this is a, a, a more special type of windscreen because it's also a mount. It's also a mount. And again, your lav or your shotgun would just slide in there and mount on the clips, and then it shuts off like that. So you can take a look at that. Yeah, if you're in an outside environment, if you're outside and it's windy, uh, I would often recommend that you're going to need some type of windscreen, all right, some type of windscreen. Uh, now, the blimp itself has an additional windscreen. The blimp itself has an additional windscreen, all right, dead rat. And so the blimp will slip inside of this. Okay, the blimp will slip inside of this. It's actually, it's lined in sort of a shiny nylon type of a thing. But it'll slip inside of that, and that's going to really cut down on the wind noise. Uh, by the way, this is actual, real rabbit fur. So for those of you that, I'm just kidding, it's synthetic, or is he? Would real fur work better? No, it would just smell worse. <laughs> Go with synthetic. Poor bunny. Oh, hippity hoppity blam! Oh, that just got recorded. <laughs> hippity hop. Look at the pretty little squirrel. Squirrel meets purple. I love it. I actually taught with a guy in Arizona that used to hunt squirrels for food. I'm not kidding. Um, all right. So windscreens. And the blimp is also a windscreen and a mount. Another type of mount, uh, which is rather basic and it's almost sort of a no-brainer. Uh, this is a desktop mount. This is a desktop mount right here. This cast iron base cast iron base with just a little extension right here. All kinds of different microphones can be mounted onto this type of a desktop. Uh, and how many of you have ever seen a floor stand? It looks like this, it's just bigger. Those are called floor stands. 
floor stand. So it's a big cast iron base with a longer pole on it. That's a floor stand, floor stand. Uh, another type of ex uh, mount, does anybody know what this is called? Yeah, it's a boom, a boom pole, a boom pole. And a boom pole, nine times out of 10, is being used for, oops, no wonder. It's being used for a shotgun, although I suppose you could actually mount a handheld in there if you wanted to. Geez, someone really tied that up tight. All right, so this boom pole here, this, is, this one's not all that big. But you put the mic in there, you put the microphone in there, and you can even see the wire connector for it. And then what you would do is you would hold the microphone up out of the shot, right? So the cameras are shooting underneath of it. And then you can easily follow your talent. You can follow your talent if they're going to move around. You can hold it by yourself. Uh, yeah. But listen, they're pretty light. They're actually pretty lightweight. The longer they are, the heavier they are. Uh, they make them out of aluminum, which is the heaviest. The ones that are made out of carbon fiber, they're nice because they're super lightweight. You can have a super duper long one, but how much do you think a carbon fiber one costs? Yeah, real money. <laughs> All right, but that's a boom pole. Uh, listen, there's no such thing as a boom microphone. So if you ever don't use that, there's no such thing as a boom microphone. Boom mounted shotgun. Boom mounted shotgun. A boom is a mount. It is not a mic. It is a mount. Now, if your boss wants to call it a boom mic, fine. All right, don't argue with him. But when you become the boss, you could say, Dr. Ryderback's head. All right. So booms are another type of mount. So that's mainly for a shotgun? Yeah, primarily for a shotgun. Primarily for a shotgun. Um, Although it's nice, you know, you can, you can use it with a handheld if you wanted to. Uh, the other nice thing about them is, uh, let's say you're, you're out on a shoot and there's, you know, someone's coming out of a courthouse or something like that and everybody's crowding together to try to, you know, get a microphone in front of somebody's face. Well, if you've got one of these, you can stand back and just follow them along, right? Wouldn't that be nice rather than crushing in there the reporter let the reporter jump in there and get crushed if you're the audio person hey man i'm back here have my, have my starbucks makes sense uh, another type of accessory that i want to talk about is also a mount looks like a giant plastic clear plastic mixing bowl looks like a big mixing bowl and it's also a mount it's a mount for uh a shotgun, it's another type of mount for a shotgun. Uh, and it's called a parabolic. It's called a parabolic. Parabolic. And a parabolic looks like a big mixing bowl kind of a thing. Looks like a mixing bowl, all right? But there's a spot in there where you can jam a shotgun inside of it, all right? And so the shotgun's coming off sort of like this. And this is what you would see. It's got a handle. It's got a, well, I'm not very good at drawing, but it's got a handle where you can grab onto it. Uh, and that's what you would see an audio tech using, say, at a football game or a basketball game or something like that. Uh, what do you think that parabolic is going to do? What's it do for you? Yeah. Yeah, it's focusing those airwaves. Remember those airwaves that I drew right at the very beginning of class? It's going to grab those and focus them toward your acquisition device, your mic. Is it going to allow the mic to pick up very faint sounds from a further distance? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, really think, of, how many of you have been on a football field, like an honest-to-goodness professional football field? 
Are they big? They're huge. They're huge. And so there's no way that, you know, if you're the audio operator, you simply can't move that fast that far. And so if you had a parabolic and you had something like a hypercardioid shotgun mounted inside of it, hey, now we're talking turkey. You can pick up sound from, you know, 70 yards easy. Does that make sense? So again, pick the mic, pick the mic based on uh, the situation that you find yourself in. But anyway, uh, microphones are really quite amazing. They, they really are quite amazing devices. In fact, uh, middle of the winter time, middle of the winter time, you're in your house, you have your doors closed, your windows shut. I could pull up outside uh, and with the right kind of audio equipment, you know, I can point a microphone at your house uh, and then I can start to look for sounds that are consistent. Uh, your furnace is at, let's say, 40 hertz. Run it through an equalizer and cut it out. Uh, your refrigerator is at 60 hertz. Take that, run it through the equalizer and cut it out. And the next thing I know, I'm listening to you make your latest heroin deal and you're busted, right? And you can do that kind of stuff with audio. It's really pretty amazing. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you see on CSI that has to do with audio is actually real. Most of CSI is complete baloney. They make stuff up all the time. Well, if we do this, we can detect that, and they're busted. No, it's, a, it's not. We, don't, we can't do that. But the audio stuff, that's legit. The audio stuff is legit. Okay, questions, questions, questions. Parabolic, parabolic, P-A-R-A-B-O-L-I-C. Yeah. All the time. Sure. Other questions? All right, so now I want to talk about cables. I want to talk about cables. Uh, and so the most common cable that you're going to run into in a professional audio situation looks like this. Uh, when we talk about cable, we are really not talking about the wire itself. The wire might be fatter than that, thinner than that. It might be a different color. Uh, don't really care. What we care about are the connectors. And the connector is what determines the name of the cable. Does that make sense? The professional grade audio cable is called an XLR. XLR cable is professional grade, all right? Now, this one happens to be about a 20-foot XLR. A 20-foot XLR. And as I pass it around, take a real close look. It has uh, XLR female and XLR male connectors, all right? Yeah, that's the three pins or three holes, all right? So take a look, XLR. Another prograde cable looks like this. Uh, any of you have an a electric guitar or something like that or an amplifier, you've probably seen this type of a connector. Does anybody know the name of that thing? The nickname is a phono, but does anybody know what that actually is? Anyone? Quarter ring. What? Quarter ring. It's a quarter, yeah. This is a quarter. Now this one has one little black stripe on it. What's that mean? Nope, one. Little black no, stripe. Mono, right. mono. So this is a one quarter mono. One quarter mono. Uh, by the way, it's one quarter inch in diameter. It's got nothing to do with the length, all right? It's a one-quarter mono because it has one little black stripe on it. That's a prograde connector. Let's see. This one here has, this is a one-quarter, but it's got two black stripes. Stereo. 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 Still professional grade. One-quarter stereo. One quarter stereo. 
But again, in a professional environment, what, what you're going to hear in a professional environment, what you're going to hear is someone will tell you, hey, go get me a 50-foot XLR. Go get me a 25-foot, one-quarter male mono to XLR female. Does that make sense? They're going to tell you what they want based off the connectors. Uh, then we go on to the consumer side. Uh, and the first one on the consumer side that I want to show you. How many of you have connectors like this? These little itty bitty things like that. Maybe you're, uh, no, it's not really for television. How many of you have headphones like for your iPods uh, or your iPhones or whatever? Uh, and it's these little itty bitty pins. This one has one stripe, so it must be mono. This one has two stripes, so it must be stereo. So I'll pass these around, but you tell me what the name of that thing is. What is it? It's what? A one eighth. Bingo. It's a one eighth. Also known as an eight millimeter, AKA eight millimeter. But it's a one eighth. And again, what we're talking about is the diameter of the pin. The diameter of the pin. And then, how many of you ever got a set of these with some type of uh, device for your TV set? Anybody ever seen these things? Does anybody know what those, what, what the, what, what are those? What are those? Does anybody know the name? That's what they are. They're RCAs. RCA. So one eighth comes in mono and stereo. And then you've got RCAs. RCAs were designed for the consumer industry so that you could hook up your own VCRs and your own DVD players and whatnot. And they color coded the whole mess so that you wouldn't screw it up, right? So red is audio and white is audio and then the yellow one you're supposed to use for video right do you remember this okay well guess what if you really want to be a rebel it doesn't matter they're all exactly the same go ahead and use the yellow one for audio Ooh. but now we're using hdmi and all that stuff but anyway this particular type of connector was consumer grade designed for home use all right but you may be wondering what is really the difference between pro and consumer? What's the real difference between the two columns, between pro and consumer? Can anybody tell me? Well, it's quality, yeah. But why? That's part of it. It has to do with the quality of the actual connectors and the cables. But let me bring it down to physics, all right, which is where I was going with it. This type of wire carries positive and negative. This type of wire carries positive, negative, and ground. Professional systems are grounded, grounded systems, all right? So uh, if any of you have a car stereo, and you think it's really cool and thumping and you spend a lot of money on it, if it's not grounded, it's not jack, all right? So if you have a friend that thinks that they have a super cool car stereo, whatever, if it's not grounded, it ain't, it's not jack, all right? So grounded systems, grounded systems are grounded all the way through. Grounded systems are grounded all the way through in order to reduce interference from other RF devices uh, and also to handle noise. All right. All right, questions. Questions, questions. Five microphone types, five pickup patterns, lots of different kinds of little accessories and windscreens and mounts, plus a bunch of different kinds of cable.